apparently the day that I choose to film a video is the day that the building decides to send over construction workers. I feel like it always works like this. So I can't film in my living room because of the noise. I've chosen a room, again, not my usual setup. I've chosen a room that is not as noisy, but if you hear hammers, if you hear noises, I can't really do much about it. So there might be a bit of ambient background noise in this video. I'm sorry. Also, I should mention this really quick. I listen to the audiobook, so I don't have exact lines of what people said. I am just, I, I wrote down everything as best I could, but I'm just sort of, I'm not going to say on page this or on this, this. I'm just going to say kind of, I'm going to just relate as best I can. Sorry. I didn't do my intro. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm very excited to film this video today, despite all the background noise and stuff. Today, I'm going to be talking about Ernest Cline's sequel to Ready Player One, which is aptly named Ready Player Two. And as per usual, I have taken a multitude of notes in which I can reference throughout this video. And yes, I initially made a video reacting to the first couple of chapters of the audiobook Blind, which I will be linking somewhere. It isn't really a very cohesive video. It's just me like blind reacting and just sort of having a funny reaction to certain parts. But I didn't, like I said before, like in that video, I didn't know that Ready Player One had a sequel. And I'm like, oh, it probably came out like a few years after the first book. No, it came out like maybe a week ago, like the end of November. And I'm like, all right, let's strike while the iron's hot and get moving on this. I did not like Ready Player One very much. I thought that it was very much so a Gary Stu power fantasy where this guy who has like this infinite knowledge of obscure pop culture references can just do no wrong and treats, you know, women in a less than ideal way. And the beginning of it, sure. The beginning of it was fine. Like I kind of liked the world that was being built. I liked the idea behind like an Easter egg hunt. I thought that was really cool. Like I thought like the whole premise behind it was great. It's just the writing and the execution of it, not so much. I didn't have high hopes going into this book and I was kind of <laughs> right to not have high hopes because there were a lot of things in this that I found annoying and I'm pretty sure what I'm saying isn't really new like I'm pretty sure like, all the I haven't really read any reviews about it I watched one video which I'll link down below and it was basically just sort of like a summary of the book so so I'm really sorry if I say some stuff that sounds a lot like what somebody else has said and I don't properly credit them. I, if I say something that somebody else has said, please link the article or the video like where they said it like down below, because I want to be sure to, you know, if people come in and they read this comment section or whatever, I want to be sure that I give, you know, the people who have similar opinions to me are credited as well. So like I said, I really am not trying to rip anybody off. I just wanted to make that very abundantly clear. Um, okay, so going into this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the summary very, very briefly, or like my interpretation of the summary, and then I'm going to go over some predictions, and then I'm going to get into like the meat of the video, which is my opinions, because everybody has opinions. So the plot of this book, it takes place after Wade, I'm going to be referring to Wade as Parzival and Wade kind of intermittently throughout this video. The same thing with Samantha and Artemis. Um, so I'm sorry for any inconsistencies, but Wade is Parzival, Samantha is Artemis. And there, this takes place after Wade has won Halliday's Easter egg contest. And he is the head of this corp of the corporation that, you know, distributes like headsets and, you know, is in control of the Oasis, which is the virtual world that people link into to escape their lives. And the book starts out with him kind of explaining him finding a new piece of technology that Halliday created in secret because if anything is consistent about Halliday, it's that he is a very secretive, sneaky, just gross guy. But we'll get into the grossness later. Wade discovers this headset, which allows you not only to link into the Oasis, but to feel things. Like you can touch things, you can taste things, you can smell things, etc., etc. It's just like a full set, like a brain scan, like a full neural 
sensory experience and it is called the ONI but I'm referring it to it as the ONI because it's just easier to say. And Halliday leaves instructions with this system being like, look, I want you to take time to figure out whether or not you want to distribute this to the masses. This technology has the potential to bring about the downfall of mankind. And I'm like, ooh. I'm like, yeah, this potentially has, this has promise. We're launched into this whole diatribe of them, you know, deciding to release the, to the, release the Oni to the public. But Samantha is very much so against it because she's like, the world is literally collapsing around us. And there, like, ever, like there's so many people like still left in poverty. And this is just like proving to be another escape for them when they really need to be focusing on, we really need to be focusing on making the world, the actual world better because it's just the, the planet is getting to the point where like humanity and just life is not sustainable. And of course, nobody listens to her and they go on with distributing distributing the Sword Art Online, the Oni headset anyway. And that leads to some tension between Samantha and Wade. So that is sort of like a prologue. And then it sort of launches into what I've written as Rich boy is sad because girlfriend breaks up with him. Apparently there is so there's so much of a rift between uh, Sam and Wade that they break up and he reverts back to his internet addiction that he knew back when he was a kid in the stacks and when he was doing the hunt for the Easter egg in the first book. And very early on in the book, we are introduced to the fact that, oh, hey, there is another fetch quest that is going to be happening because apparently that is the only thing that this author knows how to write are fetch quests. And this fetch quest revolves around Ogden Morrow, one of the founders and like the creators of the Oasis. It revolves around finding the seven soul shards of like the seven siren shards, like something about shards, like it's seven shards that are related to his dead wife, Kira. And I'm like, all right, that's not what I was expecting this book to do, but we'll go with it and shenanigans happen. Basically, Wade is like, all right, well, I'm gonna go on the hunt for this shard because I have nothing else to do. So I'm gonna just take a chance and look around for this for this shard thing and go on another adventure. And with, with help from another little group of people, he finds the first soul shard. This opens up a new scoreboard. It's like, oh my God, a new fetch quest is going on. And then, Right after this new fetch quest starts, Ogden Morrow vanishes. People meet up the founders, like the big, the high five, the Shoto, H, Samantha, Wade, and it would be Ogden, but he's not there. They meet up in the uh, virtual world. Wade has his powers, like his robes of anorak that allow him to travel around. That's taken away from him. And everybody is trapped inside of this network until the seven shards are captured. And oh, by the way, they are claiming these seven shards for a, a an AI version of Halliday, Anorak, that has become corrupted and is now a sentient AI and is like, hey, find these soul shards for me or I'm gonna keep everybody in here. They can't log out, their brains will get fried. Basically just commit like mass murder. And yeah, you can't be inside of the Oni neural network for more than 12 hours or else you'll suffer like neural uh, shutdown syndrome or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but basically you can't spend more than 12 hours linked into this because your brain will get fried. And if you stay in longer, if you like manually overclock the system, you're, you'll basically go in, into a coma or suffer brain death. So after this point, it's just fetch quest time. Of course, Wade, you know, gets everything that he needs to, all the while being upset about his girlfriend leaving him. And there is a big old battle to the death between uh, Anorak and Ogden. And oh, lol, JK, death doesn't mean anything in this book. Yeah, the ending is, there. there's like, the, the basically the Oni takes like a brain scan and backs up your brain, like your consciousness, every time you log in using that headset. So with this resurrection wand that Kira, oh yeah, they find Kira, uh, bestows upon Wade, you can basically resurrect people as an AI in the Oni. And apparently we find out later on in this book that this whole story is being told from an AI version of 
Wade up in a spaceship called the Vonnegut that he mentions earlier on in the book uh, that was created as like a doomsday, like a basically like a giant bug out bag. And he basically it's like his consciousness and like his friends and like a, a select number of people are like AI, like walking around in this spaceship and like all the people in the Oni net have their memories backed up for when they find a new planet and they can colonize it. And there's people left on Earth below. So basically it's just like, like existential crisis, the ending. It's weird. I'm gonna get into that a little bit later because that ending just, I hated the ending. Like the end, oh, okay, plot. What I've, what I've written down, Rich Boy is sad because girlfriend breaks up with him. A new Easter egg quest happens again because that is the only thing this author knows how to do. Halliday is a huge incel and wants to resurrect Kira and hopefully erase her memories of her husband so they can be together. SAO fetch quest time, battle to the death. Existential crisis ending, no consequence of death, the end. So that's kind of my my little summary of the book. And I wanted to kind of go into some predictions that I was making throughout this. Because in the beginning, I was trying to figure out like where it was gonna go. Initially, what I thought this book was gonna be about was, all right, we had like the fun kind of fetch quest, pop culture -y thing of Ready Player One. And now in this one, it's like, oh, Wade is like the head of this corporation. Maybe we'll kind of get some insight into like, oh, hey, maybe I could sort of see like, I see where the Sixers, like the Suxers or whatever, like Sorrento. Oh yeah, Sorrento's in this too, but he's like so inconsequential. It's just like not even worth mentioning almost. But I kind of wanted to see him be like, oh, this is where Sorrento went wrong. And knowing what I know now and having the resources that I have available to me and being somebody who grew up in poverty, I want to see what I can do to make the world a better place because it climate change is mentioned very early on in this book. And I was also thinking like, oh, cool. Like I said, maybe they'll like, they'll like do some stuff to fix the environment or they'll do something to maybe make life more sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. Like I thought that this is gonna be a more political book. And I was in going into this with way too high hopes, obviously, because the political agenda is mentioned very early on, but it's brought up maybe like a couple more times, but it isn't like a main drive. Like the main driving point is the fetch quest, not the fact that people are becoming literally addicted to so addicted to virtual reality that they're not bothering to pay attention to anything that's happening in the real world around them. Yeah, basically like in the first in the first like chapter, Wade is basically saying when I'm listening to the news every morning, I ask my news bot to eliminate anything involving disease, war, or famine, and all he's left with is the weather. And not the fun Welcome to Night Vale version of the weather where it's like a fun indie track, but like all he's seeing is the weather report and he's like, oh well, nothing to see here folks, just the weather. Ugh. That was annoying, but the first, also the first chapter of this book just reads so much like a fucking fan fiction. Like he he basically is like, I woke up to Huey Lewis in the news on at the exact time that Marty McFly wakes up with the exact same alarm clock. And I rolled out of my king size bed with my silk sheets on my heated marble floor. And it's like, we get it, you're rich. So that is basically a wrap up of the, of the plot and kind of where I thought the plot was going. A few other things that I predicted. There's a part in part 0002 where he mentions, Wade uh, mentions tiers, like different levels of AI. And I thought, okay, is there gonna be a robot battle? I was kind of right about that. AI becomes a very big part later on in the book. There's a kind of a robot battle or the part where they're like going to rescue Ogden from where he's being held captive by Sorrento in this house and then like Sorrento gets shot. <laughs> the drones that he has like at his control in the event that he did die, go and attack the people who, who killed him. So yeah, okay, I kind of predicted that there was going to be a robot battle. So I was kind of happy about that. <laughs> I also wrote, this is very vague, but like I wrote this to kind of like remember. So I wrote, what would happen if all of this just stopped? So basically what I thought, what I was thinking is like, what would happen if the Oasis just stopped being a thing? Or what, or, and or, what would happen if Wade lost his ability to jump from place to place and be omnipotent and everything like that? You know, I did kind of predict that his 
all powerful stuff would be taken away from him. So I kind of got that. Uh, so Sam mentions again that there's like a, that this is like changing people's lives. It's for, driving them further into addiction to digital media. And I wrote, I have a feeling that Sam is either going to be further demonized or she'll be swayed to see Wade's things of things because of course he's right, quote unquote. And that she does at the very, very end when Wade resurrects Og for Kira, he's like, oh, I'll resurrect your grandmother, Sam. And then Sam is like, all right, I kind of see this. And I quote, I fucking knew Sam would change her mind. And I quote, and this is a quote from the book, your stubbornness helped me change my mind. Because that's so healthy. Like, yeah, your stubbornness and your persistence to make me do something that I'm uncomfortable doing, that of, of course, you resurrected a dead family member of mine that I'm very close to. Yeah, your stubbornness helped me change my mind. Like, for fuck's sake, it's just... I hated that. I hated so much about this and I'm gonna get into that a lot later. So um, yeah, I did predict that Sword Art Online was going to be mentioned. So like, duh, like everybody saw that coming a million miles away. I predicted that Wade, so they mentioned, they mentioned the overclock timer a bunch and I wrote, okay, he's eventually going to overclock his immersion timer to get out of some shenanigans, which I thought would mean that he is going to be in the Oni. Like he's gonna be in there this is before I found out that they're like trapped in there. So I'm like, okay, something's gonna happen where he is going to be on the verge of finding something really, really important. And then he has to get, he's getting logged out or he's on the verge of getting logged out of his Oni system. And he has to go in and manually overwrite it to finish up what he's doing. That didn't exactly happen. Um, basically Halliday or Anorak like basically forced people to stay in the in the simulation while Wade and his gang of misfit friends go on their epic <sighs> epic hunt for the shards and I also wrote called it robot uprising <laughs> there isn't really an robot uprising I just wanted to say that I also wrote Sorrento is such a boring villain because he is so, and I also wrote so since Samantha isn't in the Oni system my guess is that she's going to help save everyone driving her back into the arms of Parzival or she's going to die trying to save everyone. And she is able to like log in via the Oasis, like an old headset, but she's not able to like experience things neurally like everybody else is. So she is able to like do stuff. She's just a bit more available to do things in the real world because she's not like linked in. And there is a part where we get a death scare where she gets like, she's in a jet and she almost gets blown up. But <laughs> I wrote Artemis dead, nah. Unless, how will we get out of this one? Hey! And I wrote, lol, of course she isn't dead. <laughs> I also wrote, Siren Soul Horcrux. There is a bit where NPCs are going rogue and I wrote, Robot Uprising, the prequel. I really wanted there to be like a big old robot uprising. <laughs> I also predicted at least one protagonist is going to die maybe as a motivator. So admittedly there are deaths, like their avatars are removed from the simulation but it's revealed that, you know, everybody is, isn't actually going to get their brains scrambled. They're just going to be floating in like a limbo state. So technically, yes, the avatars die, but the actual person doesn't die. So there's no, like no real consequence for death in this book, apparently. So yeah, those are my predictions. There's a bit where I wrote, oh, OMFG, I'm not going to do a full recap of this plot. I'm going to go through my notes and scream dejectedly about this lukewarm, forgotten, tepid cup of tea of a book. I wrote that while I was, dr I'd, I'd been drinking yesterday. So um, yeah. So before I get into what I hated about this book, I'm going to talk about what I liked. There were a few things that I did like. I liked that there was a planet dedicated to Prince. That was really fun. I, I enjoyed that. Like granted, yes, it did get a bit padded and fillery at a, at certain points, but I, when I found out they were going to a planet that was dedicated to Prince, I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, I, I, I enjoyed that. There were, that was a bit that I actually enjoyed very much. And there was also a part where they talk about, they talk about like an old Sega arcade game. And it's, you know, written about, it had like a female heroine, but like in the US, it was rewritten to have a, a male hero because apparently boys don't want to play games with like girls in the title. I thought it was like, I thought it was made up, but I'm like, oh, it's actually like a thing. And it's, it's pretty cool. Like I, I, I liked that little bit of, of trivia. So that was really nice. I liked that it had a little bit of a political agenda in it. it, it it's a shame that it wasn't really developed that much. So 
Now, those are the things that I liked. And now I'm going to go into the things that I hated. And it was a lot. So grab some snacks, grab a drink. This is going to take a while. I'm not sorry for this video being long because it's going to be long. I understand that Wade is being written in a way to make him extremely unlikable in the first part of the book. I understand that he's being sort of made out to look like Sorrento version two because there's a part where he mentions like, we have this monopoly, like we've grown this business, we have this monopoly that makes the lives of poor people a bit more bearable because they can go into this virtual reality and experience things they wouldn't normally experience. It's like, dude, you're literally like Jeff Bezos right now. Like I am getting such big Jeff Bezos vibes from this, like, like Amazon vibes. Like, okay, we're this huge company making all of this money, profiting off of, you know, all of these people and, and it and also it's like a it's insulting because Wade is a child of poverty. Like he lived in the stacks, like the big trailer stacks. Like he knows what it's like to live in poverty. And he's sort of I feel like he just got like he's also he's like he's 19. Like he got sucked into this world of riches. And granted, he and his friends do start cherries, but like they're, you know, H is like starting up like, you know, she has like these like charities going on to help like LGBTQIA plus uh, people of color find sanctuary and like uh, Artemis is like running this whole thing about she's running something basically like want, she wants to save the world. Artemis wants to save the world, like the real world. Like she wants she's like doing everything she can to help like educate people on like, you know, sustainable living and et cetera, et cetera. Like everybody is doing all of these things like with their money and their fame. And Wade is like, oh, well, I'm gonna, you know, pay internet bills and electricity bills and provide headsets for orphaned children or like impoverished children. And it's like, he distributes a system that is that he knows is addictive to children as a charity. So basically, he's like, I'm doing something good for the world. I'm distributing this system that I know is addictive to children who could help save the world. But no, I'm gonna like give them an escape because I needed an escape when I was a kid. I sort of feel like the thing that Wade is doing, like distributing headsets to kids, making them addict, making them addicted to a thing that he's selling is kind of scummy. <laughs> and there's also a part where he, he, he records the breakup that he has with Sam with his Oni headset. And she's like, what are you doing? You're like, why the fuck are you recording this? Sam is saying that humanity doesn't need an escape. Humanity needs to focus on the task at hand, which is preserving the earth, which is understandable. And Wade basically says, you need to learn how to balance the Oasis and IRL. And to that, I say, fuck you, because you have actually admitted that you are addicted. You have been addicted to stuff online. Your, your company is peddling the most addictive thing ever. And you feel like you have the right to say this. Like addiction doesn't work with balance. Addiction takes over your life. The fact that he had the the gall to say, oh, people just need to learn how to balance the, you know, their real life and their life in virtual reality is just, it, it's gross. Yeah, the Oni only allows you to be in the system for like a maximum of 12 hours, but then what are you gonna do with those other 12 hours? Like you're gonna sleep. Sure. Like he's sort of driving home the fact that people are going to be in the Oni for 12 hours and then sleep and that's going to be their life. You know, it's it, it just rubbed me the wrong way. And there's also a bit where like, he's like, it's so nice to be able to shake hands with somebody without the fear of disease spreading. And I'm like, dude, too soon. And yeah, so I wrote down that Wade is literally masking his pain and trauma through his breakup with Sam with hedon hedonism. And he admits that his coping mechanism is unhealthy. But this is like in the beginning of the book. And I'm like, okay, I, you're admitting your coping mechanism isn't healthy. So are we gonna actually see any development about that? Are we gonna see any growth about that? Spoilers, you don't. So now I'm gonna be going into my notes. First thing I wanna bring up, uh, there's a character named Lo. She's part of a group of people called the Lo Five, which are criminally underutilized in this book. Like I wanted to see way more of them, but I'm gonna get to that later. Lo is trans. Great, trans representation, right? You'd think that, but so angry about how he handled this. So a little backstory. Wade finds out that Lo is trans. So basically he has the ability to look at people's uh, information with the robes of Anorak. So he can look at uh, people's, you know, real name, birthday. He can like look through people's like hat, like the goggles, like the VR goggles, which is gross. In this book, he finds out that Lo is trans 
and he's like, oh, that's cool. Um, because of the Oni system, I now know what it's like to have sex as all genders with all genders. And the fact that he brought up, that was the first thing that he brought up. Like, he's like, oh, she's trans. Oh, that's cool. He could have just left it at that. Like, oh, she's trans. Great. But the fact that he had to mention, I know what it's like to have sex as a trans person. And I know how, what it's like to have sex with trans people. So therefore, I am super accepting. And there is a little bit, like, later on where he's like, oh, admittedly, like, I didn't want to, like, admit that I like Prince because I felt like, weird about Prince. And I'm like, oh, is this, like, a sexual awakening or whatever? But that's never touched on. Also, like, this him looking at her private file and seeing that she's trans without her telling him him being weighed that she's trans it's basically like outing somebody and as you know i'm a member of the lgbtqia plus community i identify as non-binary gender fluid so i'm not saying this i'm not trying to speak on behalf of the trans community just because i'm a member of the lgbtqia community. I'm not trying to speak for trans people and their experiences, but I will say that coming out is a very personal thing that people can do. And some people choose to not come out because it is a safety thing or they feel they're just not ready. They feel like their parents or their family or their community just might not accept them. There's a whole multitude of reasons. And to be fair, Wade didn't say anything. He didn't say, you know, oh, I looked at your file and I saw that you're trans or he didn't say that she was trans to like his friends or whatever. But I feel like him digging into her file and finding that bit of information is sort of like outing her in a way, like outing Lo in a way. And it just, it felt really skeezy that he had to do it that way. You know what I mean? Not to mention her, I, her being trans did not serve the plot in any way. It's literally brought up as the author being like, look at me, I'm accepting of trans people. And it's never brought up again. And Lo is barely utilized in this book. Her friends are even less utilized in this book. And I wanted to see them band together and kind of see if they could, you know, take their collective knowledge and band together. And because Lo is the person who helps Wade find the first shard. And I'm like, oh my God, this could be great. Like they could take like, the, they call themselves the low five and like the high five, they can meet and they do meet, but it's like for like two seconds. And they'd be like, oh, hey, we have all these different areas of knowledge. Let's like find these shards and get this fetch quest going. And that didn't happen. Like I kept making predictions about Lo throughout the book. Like I kept thinking, oh, maybe there'll be a point where a bit like in a quest where it's like you have to reveal like a deep dark secret or something like that. And I also did predict that Lo was trans because it's mentioned that or like at least non-binary or gender fluid because it is mentioned that she changes the gender and appearance of her avatar from like male to female like pretty regularly. I feel like Wade could have found this out as a more important plot point. This, him fighting out this way feels like it was thrown, thrown in just to get it out of the way for any future plot points. And spoiler, there were no future plot points involving this. I just sort of feel like him finding out her identity via spying and then saying, I'm accepting of all genders and sexualities and representations because of the Oni, it just, it, it bothered me a lot. Like it was just the way that, I did not like this. I did not like the way that a, a trans person was represented in this book. It, it, it didn't, fe it didn't sit right with me. And the fact that it's like, like I keep saying the fact that he had to mention, it's like, I'm accepting of trans people because I've had sex as a trans person. It's like, maybe if you were kind of like, oh, I'm accepting of people in the, uh, in the LGBTQIA plus community because, oh, hey, I relived the Stonewall riots or I, you know, I mean, to be fair, like they wouldn't have like the Stonewall riots like as like, you know, a memory thing because of the Oni, but like maybe, hey, I went to a pride parade or I, you know, went to a rally or I went to like a protest or I was a contestant on like RuPaul's Drag Race. And like, she wasn't even mentioned in the epilogue. Like, ah, I, I was so angry. I was so angry that they chose to bring about a character and bring up her identity and, you know, sort of flesh out these characters and then never use them. It just made me so fucking angry. That was one of the things I was the most angry about about this fucking book. So the next thing I want to do, which is the references. The dialogue and references of the characters is very cringe. Admittedly, I am very cringy. I say, I still say stuff like hella, like I unironically say jeepers 
and oh golly or like I say stuff like heebie-jeebies yeah I reference stuff I'm wearing a Deadpool cardigan and an Attack on Titan t-shirt like I, I I reference pop culture every single day you know I understand that when you are a part of a certain demographic you are going to reference pop culture and referencing pop culture is fine but like the way that it was written in the book this whole thing literally reads like how do you do fellow kids <laughs> There's also a bit where, like, Sonic EXE is mentioned. I wrote, Sonic EXE, what the fu- what? Ah! Why are you referencing that creepypasta? Stop it! Uh, it's like, yes, I know it's their niche. Their, like, their niche with pop culture references is the 80s. I understand that. There was one part where he goes to meet Lo, and their whole, like, bit, like, their whole, like, place where they're hanging out in is referencing hackers and Underworld is playing, and I'm like, Underworld! I love Underworld! I can relate to this. Yes, I know their niche is the 80s and that provides their advantage of thinking about clues that Halliday has left for them. But hearing them use phrases like leet and epic reads like a youth pastor sitting backwards on a chair trying to be relatable to a bunch of kids. Yes, I understand that the characters are 19 and like they're, you know, they're young adults and whatever, but I literally don't, I, when I was a teenager, I didn't really know anybody who spoke the way that they did. Like I knew a few people who did, but it wasn't like a common thing. So another another thing I wrote was climate change and the world going to shit ob ob obviously took a backseat to the fetch quest that they were going on. But I feel like exploring the nature of addiction through VR while the world collapses and trying to find ways to fix it would be a much better story. But no, we had to have a clone of a dungeon crawl from the first book that moves at a glacial pace because the first book was all pulp culture and that's all this character knows how to be. Wade has the tiniest character development arc, and it's only because he misses his ex, and any and all things he wants to improve about himself are solely to win her back, not for his own personal gain. This book is 85% dungeon crawl, with the rest is plot progression, just like the first book. Strong start, and then stagnation in the middle. And the stagnation in the middle, and the way that this, the plot and the fetch quest just padded out, also adds to the sensation of that their actions don't have any urgency to them. Like, they're just taking their time to explain he's... Ernest Klein is taking his time to explain the world around the characters and what they're doing, even though they're on a very obvious time crunch. They have 12 hours to find these soul shards. And if they're like, the, like half a billion lives are at stake here, but it just, it, it feels like it's just crawling. Like I know it's called a dungeon crawl and a fetch quest, but it's like, there's no, I feel like there's no urgency. Like they're like, oh, like there's, there's this whole part where they're like arguing back and forth about like semantics of one video game or something like that and there's a few parts where he's like hey can we argue about this later and blah blah, blah. but it just it's a, it moves at a glacial pace and I was listening to this audiobook at like 1.5 speed to kind of power through it and even then it was just kind of like fucking hurry up if it was like character building or something or if they were like exploring other things like it might have been a bit more forgivable like even the ending it got to the point where I was just so detached from the characters I didn't even feel anything when they when their avatars died like I didn't feel anything when Ogden died because Ogden is brought up in the beginning as like this found father like this whole there's like a tiny element of found family thrown in there but it's just so like inconsequential it doesn't even fucking it shouldn't even been brought up in the first place like when Ogden dies I didn't really feel any emotion like I did not feel any emotion for any of these characters I think like when Sorrento died like when Sorrento got shot I literally laughed <laughs> Because it was just in such a stupid, like, way. Like, Anorak shoots Sorrento, and I'm just like, oh, okay, bye, Sorrento. We, we made, like, this whole thing about him, like, breaking out of jail, and then he just sort of... Sorrento didn't add anything to this, and he literally, like, the few times that he was in, it was just, like, very much so, like, hmm, like a snidely whiplash kind of character, and it's just, it was so fucking dumb. Yeah, they're... They're not, this is sort of segueing into my next bit where their actions don't have any consequences. Death has no consequences here. And this is even before the resurrection wand, which I imagine looks like an immersion blender, was brought up. Uh -huh. So yeah, the rod of resurrection, I literally was writing, good lord, no, don't do it. This isn't good. I don't like this. Resurrection is a big no. You can't honestly think this is good. This means no consequences. No, oh my fucking god, don't go to the spaceship. Wait. The fuck is talking? This is AI, Wade? What the fuck? I hate this! I can't, like, I can't believe he actually used the resurrection wand. And I can't believe that he sees resurrection as, like, this big, beautiful thing. Resurrection is something that should not be taken lightly. Nobody should take resurrection as lightly 
as this guy does. Like he looks at it and he's like, oh, this is kind of weird. Maybe I should think about this. Nope, zap, zap. It just brings people back to life. We've been granted immortality. Like this is not something that should be seen as like a carefree thing to do. Like, yes, I understand like you're, you're young and you want to be young forever and you want to live forever you know, to go off into space and everything. But the, the fact that he didn't even take a lot of time to like sit on it, like I feel, I felt like Kira would hand him the Rod of Resurrection and he would be like, all right, cool. I'm going to sit on, I'm going to take some time, meditate. Because he's been out of the, like when he goes and gets the Rod of Resurrection, he's been out of, he's just finished his epic fetch quest or whatever. He's been out of the Oni for like 15 hours. And he's like, oh, time to go back in. And Sam was like, do you really want to go back in this soon? He's like, yes, sir, something I must do. And it's like, he hasn't had any time to process any of this. Like he started to suffer the effects of like neural fuck up syndrome. And it, it just felt so haphazard and just so slapdash put together. The ending is just one gigantic fucking existential crisis. Like the robot version of Wade or the AI version of Wade has been telling this whole story. And he's like, oh yeah, the uh, flesh and blood Wade is back on earth. And he's like married to Samantha and they have a kid and they're like trying to make, he's like actually taking the time to make the world a better place for everybody and like for their kid and, and stuff. But it's like, think of this AI version that is perpetually 19 talking to yourself as you're aging like you are watching yourself age like that freaked me out like it, it I, I, I did not like that at all like that's just no the whole shift of the story being told by Wade's AI self is stupid and unnecessary like especially when he's like well the earth is still going to shit but hey nobody died because of the oni system nobody died because of the oni headset so people still like it we can all have our distractions yippee onwards to the stars like, no like there are no consequences there need to be consequences if somebody dies like okay there are some like you know story points that you know okay cool if you die like you can maybe bring them back or like bring back like a spirit version of themselves and i think ai could technically be seen as like a spirit version of yourself but like in a world that doesn't have any consequences like he just he romanticizes the idea of immortality and that's just weird like I do not like that I honestly can't tell if this book is satire I can't tell if it is being if it's mocking it's like if it's mocking people who have this way of thinking and if it is mocking people with this way of thinking like that's kind of insulting even further because it's like okay yeah I do know people who kind of have this way of thinking about things like myself included like I am very very devoted to certain topics that I like and I could like um you know I could talk about stuff like obviously I can talk about Danganronpa I can talk about Jojo's Bizarre Adventure I can talk about Silent Hill I can talk about a multitude of things all day I I, I don't I'm, I'm still sort of processing all of this but I can't tell if this book is actually genuine or if it's satire another thing that bothered me was the fact that like the first book is kind of notorious for being like not very kind to its depiction of women. So it's just sort of like, oh, you don't like how we depict women? Cool. Let's make Kira the main point of this fetch quest. And it's like, um, because like, I, like the whole point, it's like, yeah, Kira, a woman, is the whole point of this fetch quest, but it's for this fucking incels fantasy. So how they made an AI of Kira with the first like neural scan that he created. He made an AI of her without her consent and was like, oh, we're, I'm gonna create an AI of you and I'm gonna erase the memories of your husband so we can be together. And like, eventually he's like, oh, what I did is wrong or like, what have you. But at that point, like, fuck you, Halliday. Fuck you, Anorak. Like, fuck you for having this level of, of obsession over a woman who you had like one bad date with back in the day who married your married somebody who she's obviously very in love with and you can't like just take the L and just sort of be like okay well it didn't work out I'm kind of bummed but I can go and either find somebody else or just kind of you know take this time and devote myself to my work but no that's what a fucking normal person would think that isn't how a fucking cartoon villain or a cartoon mastermind of this easter egg hunt would think the whole plot point of the whole reason for Kira being the point of this story was because of Halliday. Like it, it honestly, it didn't even feel like it was about about Kira. It was about Halliday. Like yeah, Kira is you know she has like all these references. Like they're, she's like they're going through like the fetch quest and everything like through all of these worlds that were built for her and built by her because of the things that things that she likes. But at the end of the day, it's all about fucking Halliday. And it 
Mm. Gotta love that the only way to make anoracule empathy is to copy the consciousness of his friend's dead wife, who he loves and obsesses over, brings her back as an AI, and has to look through her memories through her eyes to see how in love she actually was with her husband for him to gain any sort of empathy. Like, for fuck's sake. I hated that. I hated that so much. Like, the representation of trans people or the misrepresentation of trans people like the misrepresentation and the misuse of women wade having the fucking tiniest character development arc his other friends barely being mentioned like in any other context rather than like them helping him in his fetch quest he like mentions them being like his found family and i am a sucker for found family i love found family stuff but you can't just say oh they're my found family and then kind of you know our bond is unbreakable and kind of you know just leave that there like in harry potter there's like a whole bit where you know they're mentioned like in like maybe like the seventh book i think it's harry potter but it's like if their relationship was strong before now it was unbreakable that was mentioned in like the later book and i can accept that because we've had seven volumes of this book to dedicated to their development as a found family and in this it's mentioned like in the beginning where it's like oh we went through this big fetch quest together and we were friends before but now we're now we're found family and it's kind of like yeah, I guess, but also like in the first book, their relationships weren't really explored all that much. Like they're developed, like they're friends, sure, but I don't know that the whole found family element just felt really slapdash to me, very like haphazardly put together. I like again, I n understand that like this is just me being nitpicky, but this is also just like my re initial reactions when I first read this, and yeah. I did not like this book. Like, admittedly, I did like The Prince Planet, even though it dragged a lot, but I completely forgot there was, like, a whole fucking John Hughes planet, and, oh, uh, God. No, I'm giving it, like, a one. I'm giving it one star. I'm giving this book one star. I, I, I don't like giving things zero stars, because admittedly, like, it was kind of fun in some parts. There were parts that made me laugh, sometimes for the wrong reasons, but, yeah, I, I'm giving this book one star. I did not like it. I will probably not, uh, return to it. There is a, oh, random side note, I, I just remembered this. There's a part on the on the Prince planet where they're having a band battle. It's very much so Scott Pilgrim, like they're doing like, you know, Sonic, like, ant, like battles and stuff like that. And I'm like, I, I kind of chuckled reading that because I'm like, oh, what is it about me and band battles? <laughs> kind of going back to like the Welcome to the Mansion story. Like, what is it about me and band battles? Oh my God. All right. Um... This is gonna be a pain in my ass to edit, so I should probably wrap up. Yeah, that is my review, uh, my hot takes, my ranting about Ready Player Two by Ernest Klein. <sighs> One day I will read something that I actually enjoy on this channel, but I don't know. I so I'm, I sometimes kind of feel like reading bad books and like venting about them is sort of cathartic. So, uh, yeah. I love and appreciate every single one of you who take time out of your days to watch my videos. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you're having a wonderful week, weekend, whatever part of the day or week you're watching this video at, and I will see you all in the next one, whenever that may be. Love you. 